Hi, this is Heidi Gaiman from ilovemyshepherd.com with our final video for our Chasing Freedom study. This is video number six called Freedom from the Show. We have the show in quotation marks, you'll see. So first, my first question is, what is your favorite show? Uh, we, I think a lot of times when you sit down with people, you end up talking about the shows that you watch. Um, even if you're not an avid TV watcher, even if you only stream things like we do, or if you uh, watch copious amounts of Netflix one day and then don't watch TV for 100 days, or maybe you have stuff you catch every week. Maybe you don't watch anything, but once upon a time, maybe you saw a show that you can relate to that you're like, ooh, I like that one. So what's your favorite show? That's our kind of get to know you question today. Um, there's something about the ability to zone out when we watch TV, even when we're blessed to connect to the show because it's meaningful or it reflects on things that we value in this life. Um, it's still just relaxing to sit down with a warm beverage and watch something for a little bit in the evening or on a Saturday when we have some free time. Uh, I remember I have some good memories of when I was in college, I would visit my sister every Thanksgiving and in the evening we would sit and watch White Christmas or we would watch different Christmas movies or we would catch up on old Christmas specials. And I know she loves the Hallmark Channel and so occasionally we'd watch a movie on there or something like that. Uh, I love Star Trek. I think that is a pretty well-known fact. It's one of my favorite shows. While I love Star Wars, my favorite show is Star Trek and I love all of them. I'm definitely on the Captain Picard team, though. Uh, so I think we all have some things that we are likely to turn on. If we have just a moment, we're not reading a book, we just want something a little bit different, uh, we'll watch a show. So what is it about a good story, about a comedy, or about a drama that attracts us? Um, I think part of it is that it's not our life. It's not stuff we have to deal with. And so while it's uh, we might be able to relate, at the end of the day, it doesn't cause more stress to my life. I don't have to deal with the family dynamics that are going on in the show. I don't have to deal with uh, the problems that these people are encountering. Uh, those That's very comforting in a way to us that we can watch the show, but we don't have to be a part of the action. It's not stressful in that way. And then also, um, goodness knows that everyone likes a little tiny bit of a train wreck. And this is a terrible thing about human nature to admit, but I think we have to be honest with it so that we can not let it be destructive. Uh, there is something in a little drama, a little bit of action, a little bit of uh, humor going on in someone else's life that isn't mine, that I want to peek in at a little bit. And so to be honest about that human nature and not to let it kind of destruct in us and to destruct in our relationships and in our cultures is really important. Today we're going to talk about the kind of more destructive form of the show. And that's when people want a show, particularly from us uh, they or from people around us. I think that this is that like I said, it's a normal part of human nature to want a little bit of uh, action on the outside, something to watch, a, dare I say, to be entertained a little bit. And it's it's definitely part of our sinful nature. It's not a wonderful part of our nature. But then I think it reaches another level when it becomes like an expectation. When we start to ask for it, we start to look for it in ways that aren't appropriate from other people. We want their lives to be a certain way, to reflect a certain thing that we believe. And once we can recognize this, I think it can help us step back from some relationships that maybe don't have great boundaries for us. Um, and maybe help us create some responses to people when they do put expectations onto us that aren't okay and uh, give us a little bit more of that freedom, walking in that freedom that we already have in Christ, but to see it openly in our lives when people have the show that they want from us. 
So let's read Galatians 6, 11, and just the beginning of verse 12. And we'll keep moving through the end of Galatians, but I want to see, I want you to see why I created this lesson on the show. And I think you'll hear it really quickly here. Galatians 6, 11, and the beginning of 12. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. They want a good showing in the flesh. So we're going to talk about three kinds of shows that people are looking for that that kind of mm, comes into our life that make us uncomfortable and that aren't okay. And we can begin to, as the body of Christ, respond to culturally and then as individuals. So number one, it's not a physical show. This faith walk, this life is not a physical show. It's not an emotional show. And it's also not a relational show. Those are the three things, physical, emotional, and relational that we're going to look at here. When people are looking for shows from us, hopefully we can begin by the end of this lesson to identify it a little clearly and say, oh, they want a show. I'm not going to put that on for them. And that's okay. That's what we can do in our freedom in Christ. And that's what Paul is asking the Galatians to do, to say, this is not a show. We're not going to be circumcised just because it's something you want. Um, and then be able to separate what is truth scripturally from what is just someone's idea of a doctrine or uh, what's important or right and wrong. All right, so it's not a physical show, number one. I want to keep reading Galatians 12 and 13 for you. So we'll start right back at the beginning of 12 again. It is those who make want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So let's break this down a little bit with some Greek. I think that'll help us to get a fuller picture, a full understanding of what Paul is saying here. So the Greek word for good showing, good showing is you pros o fe o. I have to say it really slow. You pros o fe o. And I'll put a link up there so you can see the original notes from the text. Uh, but this means a fair outward appearance, a good show, just flat out, and to look well. And so that fair outward appearance, I think, is particularly helpful to understand that they are looking for something outward. They are not concerned with the internal heart, the spirit. And what does the Old Testament say? What does God say over and over is that he looks on the inward appearance and not the outward. So we know right away this is not okay. When we're looking at outward appearance, God is concerned with the internal things. And they want the physical show. They want the people to be circumcised so they can say, oh, they're a believer and they're not. They're right and they're wrong. That's not okay. That's not the way God works. In fact, he tells us to let him be the judge. Uh, at the end of the day, there is no physical mark. We get the internal mark and in our baptisms, but even in that, only God knows, and may we not play God, may we leave that to him and simply be deliverers of his word. So the next part I wanted to show you is the Greek word for force you. It says they wanted to make a good showing in the flesh, those who would force you to be circumcised. And this is a pretty forceful word. It also, in Greek, it's pronounced an ang kadzo, an ang kadzo, and I will put the link up there for you also but it means flat out force you also compel you and constrain you so i think the compel is kind of interesting in relation to where it says in i think it's corinthians might be colossians i think it's corinthians where it says christ love compels us and the difference from that to this these people compelling them to be circumcised so May Christ's love always compel us. That's kind of the foil 
to whatever physical show these people want that would compel the people to make them happy. No, it's Christ's love that compels, not circumcision and uncircumcision or anything else that we could do outwardly or physically. And then constrain you. I think that's a telling one. Uh, it, it reminds me of back to Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, do not submit to a yoke of slavery. Do not be, the King James says, entangled um, in slavery again. And so may we not let people constrain us. This is the law. This is God's job. This is what the law does. It helps constrain us. Although even that's debated, you know, to the certain extent, it's just the gospel working in us because we're believers and we uh, are compelled by God's love, right? Compelled by Christ's love. However, uh, the God's desire for our lives, I guess, compels us differently as Christians, constrains us differently as Christians than it does when we don't know Christ. We are under a very different law because our law has been fulfilled completely by Christ. Yes, it's there. The Ten Commandments, now we walk in, we love them. Uh, we don't always follow them. Freedom in Christ, he comes in in our darkness, in our and, and forgives and loves and heals uh, even when there's consequences. So who constrains you in your life? Who is robbing you of freedom? And this sounds like a really overt question, I know. And I'm not asking you to point fingers or throw up in the comments people's names. However, for you personally, ask yourself, who does constrain you? This is an important question for us to reflect on in our lives. Who is asking us to trade freedom in Christ for what they want in our lives? Let's just reflect on that internally in our hearts, in our prayer journals, whatever for a minute and ask God to show us, to open our eyes so that our freedom may not be constrained. When people want to constrain us, they require boundaries. It requires tighter boundaries. And it's okay to say, I'm going to spend less time with this person. This is not a person I'm going to ask spiritual advice for or advice of any kind, right? Because isn't everything spiritual? Uh, because they, while I don't not value them, it's a double negative, right? But it's true. We don't not value them. At the same time, they don't have the same place in our life as people who help us to live in freedom, who uh, just like Paul, he wants them to live in freedom. He cares for them in a way that the people who want to show from them do not care for them. And Jesus calls us casting our pearls before swine. We don't just uh, constantly let people take advantage of us in the faith. That's not freedom. Instead, we place things before God and let him show us who to give our time, talents, energy, and efforts toward for the kingdom. And that's an important thing. Lord, show us where and who and when you would have us give our time and our treasures to. We have to be able to also identify then the difference between the Jewish believers, because there's plenty of circumcised believers at, in the early church, right? People who were Jewish converts to Christianity, the difference between them and the people that Paul and the commentators refer to as the Judaizers. I think you can almost hear in there the difference. The Judaizers, these are people who want to make you into something else, that wanted to make the Galatians into something else, versus people that happen to be in some kind of grouping with those people, but are not trying to make people into who they want them to be. So let us not confuse the people that are like loosely related to people who are trying to ask the show from us. So if we have had a bad experience with the church, for instance, because maybe they were concerned about outward things, how we looked, how we dressed, how we talked. Um, maybe they were concerned with uh, the way that worship was done in a way that left hurt feelings. Or maybe there was someone in our churches that treated someone poorly. And it was even, in fact, sinful uh, that constrained someone's freedom in Christ. And we have then had a difficult relationship with the church or maybe we've even walked away to be able to say wait a minute 
that's not the church is really important. Just because they're loosely connected to the church or even it feels like they're intimately connected. To be able to say that this isn't the word of God, this is not what God teaches. And yes, the church is full of sinners, but this person in particular is maybe not well representing what the body of Christ is supposed to be to me. Um, and just to be able to accept that and to move on. Like the church, yes, will be imperfect. And that's another video you can catch, right? The imperfectly perfect life together. However, let's be honest that there are wolves in our churches. There are people that do misrepresent the church and even maybe represent darkness and uh, the things that Satan would try to infiltrate the church. And that is not the church. We can't just blanket say, oh, the church wants a show, or oh, these people over here want a show, or sometimes we do this in our families. Oh, my family, they just want a show. And we kind of cut ourselves off from the family as a whole, our extended family I'm especially talking about, or our family of origins, our childhood, uh, when really it's just one person. <laughs> and that's just, it's not fair, right? So let us make some uh, wise decisions there with our boundaries to be able to be accurate. Who is compelling us with Christ's love in freedom and who is constraining us? Things that get mixed up in the physical show. Like I said, any circumcision was the early church issue. Anything physical, any kind of uh, James brings up in his book, which we studied last spring, and you can catch those videos on the YouTube channel and the blogs on ilovemyshepherd.com. He was really concerned with people who were worried about the physical show as far as clothing and wealth. Those get really confused and mixed up in the show. What What is important? Clearly not what we wear or how much money we give to the church, things like that, or how much we even donate to philanthropic effort, efforts or humanitarian things. Um, worship can easily get mixed up in the show, and I'm not going to go into that for a long time because, wow, we can just get into some serious uh, discussion and a lot of opinions, but may our worship and how other people worship not leave us judging them based on their showing. Um what does showing up look like? I think we could argue like uh, that we want people to show up to church on Sundays and we count numbers there, right? Or we want people to show up to our Bible study that we have at our house and we count their showing there. Um, we want people to do the things that we think are important in our humanitarian efforts. Like, oh, well, they, they were not helping with this per particular mission. They weren't doing this over here. Uh, that's the show, and it's not okay. People show up in their own way. And yes, we want to hold each other accountable. You know, we missed you at worship. We missed you at Bible study. We missed you. Uh, we wish you would come to this thing. Um, yes. However, people live out their faith in very different ways. And just because they're maybe worshiping on a different night of the week and we don't know it, or they're doing their own personal Bible study in a different way, let us all interact in the body of Christ and let us encourage and lift one another up and be accountable to each other, but also make sure we're not looking for the show of showing up. And I'm the first one to say that showing up matters. Please show up. Um, but at the same time, let's not, from our vantage point, be looking for a show from anyone in that either. I think in the church, the gift of tongues or outward gifts of the Holy Spirit, teaching and leading, even the pastoral office, we can start to look for a show from, and that's not okay. I think the list in Galatians 5 of the fruits of the Spirit from Paul, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, I gentleness and self-control. Did I get them all? I'm not sure. Um, is very different than in Ephesians 4, the list, or Corinthians, where we see the list of gifts that God gives us. You can hear a little bit more about that in one of the podcasts last week. But if their gift is outward, if someone's gift is teaching and leading, may we not ask for a show from them of that? And may that gift never be considered more important than a different gift that is less outward. Uh, there is no gift greater than another. It's just the fact of the way God created us. And we all have the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, one is not better than another because they appear to have more joy or they appear to have a gentler spirit. God is working all of those in all of us in different ways. Uh, and we uh, that's between us and God. 
uh, him, us asking him if we would like uh, to see more joy in our life, to even quote unquote feel more joy in our life, to have more of an experience of joy in our life. That's between us and God. That is not between me and you and me saying to you, it looks like you don't have joy. Although there's a place in relationship that's intimate enough that we can come and say things that are more difficult to each other, right? But it's quite a bit different when we're looking for the show from someone. Uh, this happens when we want people to be able to lead before they're ready in congregations. We need to be honest. If that's not their gift right now, that's okay. All right, also valuing people for their physical abilities, for their mental abilities, for being quick thinkers maybe, or for their musical abilities. We, we want to appreciate people and the gifts that they bring within the church and in our families and our communities, but we don't want to ask for the show from them. Um, we want to go to the weaker people. And I don't even know how to judge that, right? What's weaker? I think there's plenty of days that I'm the weaker, uh, but let us look for people who aren't being asked to do things, who aren't able to show up in the way that would be considered just awesome and wonderful uh, in giving to the church or to our relationships. Let us go seek people out. Let us seek the lost, the shut-ins, the weary, the afraid, the abused, the traumatized, let us go to them. In fact, in Corinthians, it tells us that those are the more important pieces to the body of Christ. And that's why the show is just, it has no place in our bodies. It does not. Okay, so let's go on. It's not an emotional show. Let's read Galatians 6, 14 through 16. And I think you'll see why we're going to talk about the emotional show. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of our God. Boasting feels good, doesn't it? It feels, I mean, like, I really like it. Like, oh, I can teach some stuff. I feel pretty good about myself, right? Boasting feels good. It also feels good, and I'm just going to be real honest here. It feels good to boast about our parenting, uh, to throw up some pictures on Facebook. Look what my kid does. Ooh. Oh, look what they said. I mean, I am as guilty as the next person. Uh, we like to boast about our husbands. I've been that person. Uh, I like to boast about my travels and adventures, and I bet some of you do too, to boast about the amazing things our churches are doing, our lives, and our friendships. Let us remember uh, that it is really all based on boasting in the cross. I think so much more often I need to be able to say, look at what God is doing in me. Uh, and often that's in the uglier things. Yeah. Often it's in the more difficult things. And that's one reason you'll see me uh, having posts about some of the challenges that we've gone through because it's easy to glory in all the beautiful things God is doing in my kids uh, when they're being good and in my marriage when it's going well and in my uh, career and in my writing and all that stuff. But this Bible verse reminds me that at the end of the day, it's all about the cross of Jesus Christ and all of that stuff is just stuff. Even the faith life of my kids, it's not my boast. It's Christ. It's all Christ every time. He's the only one that does anything really worthwhile. So when we boast in the cross of Christ, let it be about Christ alone. And of course, that's going to be attached to some stuff in our life. Of course it is. Good stuff uh, and some difficult stuff. But just to remember, I think internally, that we're not a show, that we're not a show for social media um, and let us not put it on. But God, just Lord, meet out our hearts and help us to have the right emphasis when we go online to share our stories and when we share them across uh, from when we share coffee with someone and tell them the stories of our lives and when we share things that we do in different ways, just the, it's really a heart thing. It's not so much in what we share or even how we share it. It's in whatever God is doing in our hearts with that. Um, Lord, let me always speak freedom and truth in what I'm sharing and let it share your cross. 
What if what God is doing is not obvious? Um, I think that asking him to show you is certainly an okay thing to do, to open the word and to ask him, Lord, I, I just don't see. Show me in my life what you're doing. Help me to boast in your cross. The only thing I'll warn you is that sometimes life gets more difficult. Because sometimes that's the space he works in to show us his cross so much clearer. Um, we have freedom in seeing him in that darkness, though. There's so much freedom in that. And I had a post about, we went through just such a hard time four years ago, and I crawled through it in faith. Barely felt like some days making it through. Uh, I wanted to give up, uh, not just just give up, but to give up the faith that that was one thing that I felt like was just really difficult in my life. I didn't understand quite who God was in this mess. Um, but there's so much freedom in that because now I understand greater than ever that I can ask questions. I can say to the Lord, I have no idea what you're doing here. So please show me, show me. And he does, uh, doesn't mean it gets easier. It just means that he's, in it and it's more clear for us that cross that we boast in um and i think also the new creation is a good reminder in this passage that neither circumcision count nor uncircumcision but just that new creation that god has given us his spirit that he has died and rose for us and we are new and some days that's all we can proclaim is that you know what i don't know what's going on here but i am new <laughs> in Christ Jesus. And that's our fallback. That's what we want to be looking for instead of whatever emotions we're going through, whatever havoc Satan is wreaking in our heart and we are struggling with ourselves. Um, may we never manipulate the word I wrote down. Um, I think we can easily do that, especially when we're going through difficult things. We can look for what we want to hear. Um, and that's not boasting in the cross of Christ Jesus. But let us look for word that is contrary to our emotions sometimes. When I'm angry, I need to look for scripture on joy. I need to hear the hard stuff. When I'm anxious, I need to hear the hard stuff about God coming in and working working in that anxiety, not just him getting rid of it. Um, I said, I think things that get mixed up in the emotional show are a lot of times uh, very personal. Like we're the ones looking for the show often here of emotions. I think we trade in good for just a little bit better. Uh, we give of the, we want to just make it through instead of God doing something new, right? Didn't mean to rhyme there. I'm, I'm rhyming a lot lately in this. Um, I think we toss away mediocre and ordinary because we want exciting. And the thing I learned in our struggles is that there's so much value in mediocre and ordinary. Praise the Lord. Some days when I'm like, oh, this day was kind of boring. I am like, praise Jesus now. I want boring sometimes. I want not exciting because, wow, he does so much in that ordinary day. And it is such a blessing to my heart and soul. And I think so often those ordinary days are the days that build faith in his trustworthiness and his faithfulness for the seas and the excitement and the hilltops and the valleys to come. And then also, again, mixed in with that is valuing spiritual highs over spiritual valleys, deserts, and plateaus. And I feel like maybe there's a study coming on that soon, those different places that we find ourselves in. Um, but wow, God is in the mountaintop, but he's also in the valley He's in the desert and he's in that plateau when things just seem kind of regular. Uh, whatever the shows are in that, all of them are valuable. Uh, not just what we see from the outside and not just what we want from ourselves on the inside. Uh, sometimes we ask too much from ourselves for that emotional show and we just need to let God do his stuff. All right, so the last one is it's not a relational show. This is verses 14 through 17, and they kind of overlap. We read about the boasting, um, but I'm just going to read it again and see how they run together. It's not a relational show, and we'll think of it differently this time. Instead of just our internal emotions, uh, but our relationships in this. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world 
For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. For now on, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. It's so easy in the church to play who I know. Oh, I know the people that are circumcised. I know the people that are uncircumcised. I know those who, what does it say? Um, those who walk by this rule even, even though Paul is praising them. That just really reminds me of that language of who do I know in the faith? And it, it just really doesn't matter. Um, may we know, like I said, the shut-in who is uh, stuck in their homes and go seek them. May we know the friend who is maybe kind of more difficult th than the friend who's exciting uh, and doing all kinds of cool stuff. This isn't easy for me. <laughs> uh, I have a hard time. Like, I want my friends to be cool, right? And of course, there's going to be people that you're going to relate to more than other people. But at the same time, sometimes in the church in particular, we're called to go outside of what we think looks cool, what we think is uh, the person that we want to hang out with even. And that's both in the local church and at the church at large and in our neighborhoods. But... Occasionally, God calls us to go out of those comfortable relationships and to be with the people who have even the marks on their body. And Paul is talking about himself and the persecution he's experienced from Christ. And so sometimes we need to obviously reach out to the persecuted ones. But sometimes, I think sometimes it just reminds me of the hard people. A lot of times people who have been through abuse might have reactions to things that we don't understand the way they're reacting. They might have some maybe difficult things that need to be attended to that make relationships more difficult with them. Uh, sometimes we need to be more patient in that and seek them out. We're not looking for relational shows, people who just fill us up and make us feel good. We want real and genuine relationship. And sometimes that means it will be with difficult people. Um, circumcision at that time in the early church proved that you knew God. And that's what these people wanted. Uh, in our church today, uh, baptism commands is commanded by Jesus. So we do it. And it's a grace-based thing. It's a beautiful thing and a beautiful gift and reminder. And it does amazing work of the Holy Spirit. But let it never be a show for us. Let us never constrain people to it um, and say things that leave us just real uncomfortable. Um, let us always speak of it in grace and just as a way that God brings his spirit into our life and not this like just terribly legalistic thing that you need to be baptized one, two, three, four times and prove it. Or even that um, it needed to be done a certain way and a certain uh, by a certain person or um, that there are things that we would leave other people outside the kingdom. I'm thinking of like um, miscarriages, stillborn, suicide. None of that is for us to judge. Instead, we rely on the hope of Christ Jesus that's found um, in like the book of Samuel for unborn babies. We rely on the hope of Christ Jesus that's found in him as judge and his nature as merciful as well as just just all of that stuff and let us not look for the show that's in baptism and i think you either probably know what i'm talking about or you're like what is she's being very cryptic um but i think in some church bodies including my own we can just get easily mixed up in our doctrine and love it so much that we then kind of demand shows where there should not be some shows. So just remember that baptism is all about grace and God's gift to us. Uh, Paul's message and Luther's message in the Reformation to connect that it's not who you know, it's what been, what's been done for you. It's not who we know in the upper, upper echelons of the church. And in the Reformation is this problem with uh, Catholicism and the Pope and his word. And, um, and now I think we just get mixed up in like who the famous authors that we're reading are and who says this and I like this way of teaching and I don't like this way of teaching, especially in women's ministry. We can get really mixed up in that. And so just remembering that it's all about God's word, always going back to God's word. That was Luther's message in the Reformation. That is Paul's message to the Galatians is if Jesus didn't say it, 
then don't let it be a rule in your life. Instead, may the rule that is Christ Jesus in your hearts and lives be about what brings peace and mercy in your life. Um, let's see. I just want to read real fast the end of Galatians because it just ends with this beautiful message of grace. And if you haven't caught the podcast from this last week about restoring grace, please do so. I just love that Paul ends in grace. It's a beautiful thing to me. In Galatians, I'm going to go ahead and read 6 verses 17 and 18. From now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Amen. We understand all of this about the show, but sometimes we need the grace to be reminded. That's one reason we sit in the word, that we just, that gives us grace in our lives. And it's a reminder to sit with the brothers and sisters together and care for one another and say, freedom in Christ to one another. You know, I hope that doesn't end in your life with the end of this study. We also bear the marks of Christ Jesus. In our baptisms, uh, we were a mark was put on our forehead and upon our heart in the name of Christ Jesus. Christ gives us grace. That's how Paul can speak grace, and it lives in us in the form of the Spirit. Life, relationships, even freedom, to some extent, will always cause us trouble. Just like Paul says, I bear on my body the marks. We will have the marks of expectations, whether from ourselves or from other people. We will have trouble in the church. We will have this sinner saint struggle. Um, It is a tug of war, the freedom in Christ. My friend Ellie brought this language to my attention. I just really appreciate it. Everything we talked about in these last six weeks, and especially here with, you know, whatever this show is, is just a tug of war in the faith. Sometimes freedom looks like fulfilling expectations for people and for ourselves. It means getting off the couch and doing some stuff. And sometimes it means not fulfilling expectations of other people or ourselves. It's freedom in Christ. And it, you know, it's a daily walk in trying to find what that freedom looks like. Um, we have it. Don't ever forget that freedom is never taken from us. But we, uh, we ask God to work in us to show us the freedom each day. Sometimes it looks like order in our life. Freedom in Christ does. And sometimes it looks like rebellion. Sometimes it looks like doing something different. Sometimes it looks like trust and trusting in those around us. And sometimes it looks like turning away. This tug of war constantly is that's what freedom is. Uh, And the freedom to do it, the freedom to be a sinner and be a saint at the same time and to just live in that duality of the Christian walk. It's a beautiful thing and it will feel like a tug of war each day. A beautiful tug of war. So I'm done chasing freedom. I don't know about you. I'm going to continue to look back and reflect on the book of Galatians to remind me of that freedom I have. Galatians 5.1 still is, after studying and studying and studying, it's still one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. God values freedom. He works it in our lives. He gave it to us in totality in Christ Jesus. We stand in this tug of war of freedom, and it is a gift. It is a gift each day we have as we draw nearer and closer to Christ Jesus and as we wait for him to come back for us, and we will be in just this complete and utter freedom one day in him that we will know without a doubt, um, just as we praise him, as we thank him, and as we worship him in that place that we know of as eternity, as heaven. So let us always uphold freedom together. I think if I could leave you with one message, it is that just know that you have that freedom. It's a gift from God, but let us help each other walk in it every day. Thanks for joining me. I hope that you'll continue to join me at ilovemyshepherd.com as you look for blogs and uh, some of the work I do to advocate for women and marriage and families that you would uh, be able to reach across the table to the person next to you and share with them the hope that we have in Christ and that we would also then go forward together in this work to share his word. I'll see you next time.